I'll note I'm wearing uh, Hillary Clinton press conference pink tonight. Let's see if it makes me a little more trustworthy. They wanted TV cameras. They got TV cameras, so I suppose the hearings were successful. They, I have not seen such perfect attendance at a congressional hearing yeah, right. ever. Yeah. And they didn't even take a seventh inning stretch. There I go, Margaret. Yeah. For fear of missing <laughs> camera time. How do you ignore North Korea? Well, I'm going to ignore that question. Another, <laughs> at another time, right. I'll, I'll set right. Mark right on North Korea. Welcome back to the world over. That was the irrepressible Kate O'Byrne, who we lost on Divine Mercy Sunday to cancer. She was a beloved figure here in Washington, D.C., a town with almost no beloved figures, I might add. Kate was a feisty godmother to conservatives, and after serving stints at the Heritage Foundation and as Washington editor of National Review, she became a household name as a member of CNN's Capital Gang. Her warmth, wit, and kindness will be sorely missed in a city that often lacks those qualities. Tonight I'm joined by two of her colleagues, protégés, and dear friends. Please welcome National Review Editor-at-Large Catherine Lopez and Senior Editor at National Review Ramesh Panaru. Thank you for both being here and um, I, I wish it were under happier circumstances. Yeah. But Thank dear you for doing it. Kate deserves to be celebrated a little Absolutely. bit. And uh, I want to I want to start with her background and then how you all came to know her. Kate O'Byrne was really a public policy maven at heart. She really understood policy, and not only that, she knew how to communicate it. Here she is with Bill Buckley back in 1990 on Firing Line. Watch. Oughtn't we to change the emphasis from the one to the other? That is, say, oughtn't we to say, help everybody who's upwardly mobile to the extent that you can, even if you acknowledge that there are going to be some people who are left behind? Or are you, is neither one of you willing to make that concession? I, I am uncomfortable with the underlining argument that says, how does choice respond to the needs of disadvantaged students? Um, we can't dismantle public schools and allow other parents to have choice. We have to, in a sense, hold all children hostage in a failing public school system rather than let some escape. Mm, yeah. And I'm very uncomfortable with that notion. And it's never been the way, frankly, and, you know, the generations of Americans have advanced. Uh, the reason I wanted to show that was really this would set the course for her the rest of her life in some ways because of the Buckley relationship and then taking the reins as Washington editor of National Review, where you all came to know her. What was she like as an editor, Catherine Lopez? Well, I actually met her around the same time I think I met you. Um, mm -hmm. I was a freshman at Catholic University in Washington, wow. and I was interning there my second semester freshman year, and she was a vice president at oh. Heritage, and that's where I first met her. And I rem remember being amazed how kind she was to, you mm -hmm. know, this little scared freshman, and and um, and then I wound up working with her at, at, at National Review. And, and she, I, what what is striking and what has been striking as people share their stories over the la last couple of days is she, very much like Bill Buckley. She was the same on camera as she was mm -hmm. behind the scenes. She was kind and attentive and wise and brilliant and um, and you always just wanted to be around her and yeah. you absorbed so much and enjoyed so much. Ramesh, she had a real talent for mentoring young people, which is something you certainly don't see here in D.C. I mean, everybody's on their own track. They don't have time for anybody, even their own children. But Kate made time for everybody. What impact did she have on you and how did you meet her? Well, she had an enormous impact on me as on, as on many other people. Um, I came to work for National Review's Washington office in the summer of 1995 at the same time she did. She was already in National Review's orbit. Right. She was a trusted advisor, but she actually left the Heritage Foundation for NR around that time. And then she was between National Review and the National Review Institute. I shared an office with her for 17 years. Oh, my gosh. The, and, the secondhand smoke alone has yeah, been awful. That's, that's right. But, but I enjoyed all of it. We never had, in all that time, a crossword between us, which is pretty amazing if you know me at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, and, uh, um, she, you know, you were talking about her as a godmother of conservatives. She's literally my godmother. Yes. She was, she was there at my baptism. Yeah, and I want to talk about that later. We're going to talk about the, the Catholicism of Cato Byrne, which I think really is the spine of everything that that the goodness that she she brought to the world and even the way she interacted with political opponents i think you could sum up with her faith it really did inhabit every part of her life and this is kate o'burn at her best she had this no nonsense approach to punditry she was always very reasonable even her political opponents couldn't disagree with her this is from a capital gang reunion in 2008 on meet the press when she was asked about Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions. You can't criticize Hillary Clinton without being afraid of strong women. 
if uh, the men on the stage go after the front runner, for God's sakes, it's an attack by the patriarchy. Uh, it does her no favors, and Hillary Clinton is not going to be elected to anything if her campaign is seen as a vindication somehow of uh, this kind of old-fashioned grievance feminism. You know, with the exception of Laura Ingram and Rachel Maddow, there are no whip-smart women like this in media today anywhere that not only deeply uh, understand the policy, but can come papers, up with these withering one-liners just when you need them to sort of capture it. What, what made her so attractive and so riveting on television in this role? Well, a couple of things. First of all, she knew what she was talking about, so there was substance there. You know, in, in the tradition of firing line, right? You had a real conversation. Um, and, and as you mentioned before, you know, some of the most moving tributes come from people like Margaret Carlson, who who they didn't agree on anything, fellow panelist on, right. on, on Capital Gang. Um, but, but Kate sort of adopted Margaret as a sister. I remember being in the office, Kate would talk so affectionately about Margaret mm -hmm. because she loved people and she yeah. saw, saw them as made in the image and likeness of God, like we're supposed yeah. to, you yeah. know? And so, so it, it made it so much easier to have a conversation with someone you disagreed with because at the end of the day, you know, at the end mm -hmm. of the show, you, you, you could be people together, you yeah. know? Go you know, ahead, Ramesh. People watched her thought that she was just an enormously talented communicator, which she was, but there was a lot of off-camera work. She did a lot of homework. She did a lot of practicing her lines. In that respect, actually, and this just occurred to me, there's a similarity to Ronald Reagan, who was also treated as a great communicator, and of course he had the natural talent, but he worked and worked and worked. Yeah, no, it wasn't secondhand. She did, I mean, she, she didn't just wing it. She really studied Never. and worked and, and was ready for every occasion. She was almost like the anti-mame of Washington. I mean, she, she, Kate was always, first of all, she was literally larger than life. She was the tallest person in every room, and usually the smartest. I mean, she just lit up a room when she was there. And just full of grace and charm. And, and I was, as Ramesh was talking, just the other day I found a pile of papers and notebooks. She would take so many notes and have so much research oh. for, for a 10-minute clip on, on CNN or whatever. Yeah. She, uh, she really did want to make sure that she was d delivering the best information as mm -hmm. well as, as an, an, a whip-smart analysis and, oh, and gosh, anyway, a hard worker. And had a response to anything that the liberals would say. Absolutely. She had prepared in advance. And occasionally conservatives, too. I yes. remember yes. Her saying, now let me tell you something, Bob, and just shutting right. Bob Novak down, who right. I worked for at the time, on those Capitol gang panels. She was unafraid to kind of take all comers. And she did it with a, there was a grace about it. Oh, yeah. She was not nasty. Right. And today, television is so nasty. And as you said earlier, you've got a lot of people with half-formed opinions or things right. they picked up in the green room. Cato Byrne never, never operated like that. Snark is our era's substitute for wit, and it's the latter that she had. Right. You are right. And, and wisdom. And I want to show you this, because this, I think, of all the clips, maybe captures her the most. This is Kate's final television appearance, at least we think it is, on our show in 2014. In fact, it was Divine Mercy Sunday of 2014 three years before she would leave us, when she joined us for the canonization of John Paul II in Rome. Watch this. Kate O'Byrne, you met the Pope, John Paul II, in 1993. Tell me about that and uh, the lasting influence and impact he left on you, your family. We were in Rome and my husband Jim worked for the Bishops' Conference right. in the office to aid the church in Eastern Europe in the old Soviet Union. Uh, American Catholics rose to the challenge, you know, mm -hmm. after the fall of the uh, mm -hmm. wall when they needed so much. And so we were privileged. The boys were with us to go to his private mass in his residence. Mm -hmm. The chapel fitted maybe only 20 people, and he'd come out afterwards every morning and visit with whoever was there. Mm -hmm. So people said to me afterwards, I know he leaned over and kissed our John, mm -hmm. chatted with our Philip. Um, afterwards, people said, what did you say to him? I said, nothing. I was struck completely dumb which I think is one of his miracles, actually. It's probably, it's probably his third miracle. I couldn't say a word. <laughs> now, that is the Kate Oburn we knew and loved. She would spend a lot of time in those latter years in Rome, the, you know, really from the time she retired from NRO, she retired from Bloomberg. You, as you mentioned earlier, Ramesh, she was your godmother, also the godmother of uh, Judge Bork, Bob Novak, not exactly easy customers, let's face it. <laughs> Uh, what was it about her? Because she was instrumental in drawing you to the faith. Well, just her example. She was somebody who really lived her faith. It imbued every aspect of her life. Mm -hmm. She took it seriously. She was theologically and culturally Catholic. Yeah. And it was just such an attractive 
picture yeah. of what Catholicism should be. Yeah, I agree. And and the thing the thing that I, I'm going to cry if I talk about it, but the thing that I loved about Kate, she was such fun. Oh my goodness. Kate O'Byrne was the the most fun. You loved to be around her because she was she, she had one-liners galore, and none of them were pre prefab. They were all on the spot, and it was not only funny. It was penetrating. She understood something about humanity and people, and that, that imbued everything she did. Tell us about the last years. She retires. She really dedicates herself to her actually. family and her friends <laughs> and, and annual visits to Rome. She became a professional <laughs> pilgrim in some ways. And she really was a pilgrim. And I remember not just Rome. We, we have these National Review cruises, and oh, yeah. we spent the most beautiful day in Ephesus at Mary's house and, and where John died. And, and, and she was always so prayerful and beautiful. And actually, that that particular day, she set it up so some of us would have that beautiful day, who didn't have the money and the logistics to coordinate it all. Um, and she would give those kind of gifts all the time. Um, and she also had a knack for, for making sure she found the person who looked loneliest, saddest, quietest in the room and make sure they were part of a conversation or a lunch, you know, a lunch conversation. She, she didn't miss anything. Yeah. Um, and, and, and she was also full of practical wisdom oh, and she, advice. She, that is so true. Including I mean, making sure I had the right outfit when I met Pope Benedict. <laughs> you know what I mean? she, down to the shoes, by the way. Oh which, yeah. Rebecca. No, down to the bag. Right, right. Well, my wife used to always comment, you know, we, we'd go to dinner at, at their house or we'd meet Kate at, and, and her husband Jim at a cocktail party. And she'd say, because men never look down. We never look down to the shoes. Never. Rebecca said, did you see Kate's shoes? They matched her outfit. They had to be made together. I'm like, why are you looking at her shoes? But it was true. Kate was always done from top to bottom. I mean, she really was. And would help her friends do the same. Right. No. And school advice, career advice. She was Everything. a great editor. She edited, people don't know this, she edited the first Mother Angelica biography and the last mm -hmm. Mother Angelica biography. And how many column ideas did we get from her? <laughs> Too many to count. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to be one of the hard things for me is going to be not knowing anymore what Kate thinks yeah. about every issue that comes up, every political figure who rises. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to just be able to call her up or stroll into her office and, and ask, what do we think about this? Yeah, yeah. God bless her. Your lasting memory of Kate in our final minute. Um, I remember being in the office depressed that I was uh, about what people were writing about me and about being stressed about deadlines and things like that. Just get over yourself, Catherine. Stop being so self-obsessed, you know? <laughs> and she really knew how to get people back on the straight and narrow, mm -hmm. narrow and, and remember what's most important in life. Yeah, which became at the end of her life, she really Her family and her faith. Her grandchildren, her sons, who she always referred to as John O'Byrne and Philip O'Byrne. Always their full names. I could never understand yeah. Oh, Jim O'Byrne, too, is on the Jim phone. Jim yeah, yeah. Hold on, Jim O'Byrne's on the phone. It's your husband. Why are you giving it? But it was, you know, I, I now look back on that and I think, because she saw the totality of that person and yes. was sort of recognizing their inherent dignity as their own people, yep. not only her children, her husband, but as their own people. Ramesh, your lasting memory of Kate. You know, uh, my wife was talking to her at one point because my wife was also a really good friend yeah, of your wife, Kate's. April. And, uh, and April said something about how she loved me very sweetly. And Kate said, I know, April, but I loved him first. <laughs> <laughs> she was a great lady. What an incredible friend. I, for me, she always, there was this line, you know this, she would say it all the time. When she had a little bit of information to impart to you that she knew you either weren't getting or didn't know, she would say, as you know, Raymond, right. and then <laughs> she'd fill you in. Yes. And it was sort of her way of sparing you right. what, uh, what ignorance you had and how profound <laughs> it was. She kind of, again, setting and you And make you feel path. smarter. And make you feel great. You're right, Kate. I did. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I did know. What a great lady. I, I will Absolutely. miss those dinners in Rome and the Prosecco that I think she and I were the only ones who would drink the Prosecco. But uh, what an incredible person. May Thanks dear Kate O'Byrne rest in peace. Thank you both for being Thank here. You. And uh, and we, we will, you know, we'll certainly <clears throat> keep her memory alive. And I know you two are doing that already. And she loved you both dearly. Um, if you'd like to read both Catherine Lopez's and Ramesh Ponaru's columns, you can go to nationalreview.com. Well, that is all the time we have until next week. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com, as are the details of my New Orleans and Chicago book signings. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C.